And today I'm going to be talking about consistent data sets and period of record extension for data that you work with commonly for risk assessments. So in this presentation, we'll discuss methods to verify that the data sources come from a consistent data set. Um, this includes using independent and identically distributed data. Uh, we'll also cover the importance of using unregulated data sets, um, screening for low outliers, and talking about how to determine what type of floods are low outliers. And we'll also discuss some simple methods for period of record extension to get a larger record. <clears throat> And it's important to remember that in this lecture, we're going to be talking just about systematic, systematic data. So data that's recorded on some kind of a regular interval at a gauge, whether it's daily or annually. Uh, the more systematic data that we have, the more likelihood, over, or sorry, the more likelihood overall leverage it has on the posterior distribution. We haven't quite gotten there, but it's just an important to note for one of our future lectures that systematic data play a, a hugely critical role in estimating the hydrologic hazard curve. So one of the main assumptions we use when we do flow frequency analysis is that the data within a flow frequency time series should be independent and identically distributed. And so what does independent mean? It means that you know, event in year one has no impact on event in year two. So if you have a flood in year one and a flood in year two and a flood in year three, there's no relationship between them. You know, they, the flood in year one doesn't cause the flood in year two to be any higher. Um, a good example of this is you know, when you're rolling a dice, when you roll the dice the first time, that has no impact on the subsequent rolls. Or a coin flip. Um, identically distributed means the data come from the same parent distribution. And in flow frequency, that parent distribution is mother nature. Um, and that can technically be an infinitely large sample, um, but we always assume that it's identically distributed so that our sample data set is coming from that same, what we usually assume, log Pearson type 3 distribution. Uh, and is distributed according to that distribution. Uh, if this isn't the case, which increasingly we're seeing issues with climate change or non-stationarity, uh, that can get a little more challenging to address, but we're going to talk about that in one of our lectures tomorrow as well. And it's also important to note, though, that no data set is ever going to 100% meet these assumptions, uh, but we want to get as close as we can so that we can really work with this identically distributed and independent data set. So to avoid independence, uh, water years are often delineated uh, at the driest part of the year. So routinely, this is a water year starts on October 1st and ends on September 30th of the following year. If you work for the federal government, it's the same as our fiscal year, so you know those dates really, really well. Um, but we do that because usually we have our flooding either in the spring or summer months, and so we want when those periods of low flow are because we're trying to look at high flow periods. Uh, this can also be really important when you're doing inflow volume duration frequency analysis because like where I'm from up in the Midwest, um, we get a lot of, we get our spring freshet, which is our snow melt, and we can have rain on snow, but we can also have floods driven by rainfall events too. And occasionally we will get a really large rainfall event late in the year, like in September or October. And when you're doing like a volume duration frequency analysis and say you have like a reservoir or a dam with like a 14 day critical inflow volume duration, you know, if that happens at the end of a water year, and then that subsequent water year was a really dry year, um, you should always screen your data to look at, okay, in that year two water year, is it actually being impacted by the fact that it crossed the water year? Because we have that happen a lot. I mean, in 2019 in the Red River Valley, we had a late season flood event, and then the following year was really dry. And so our peaks were actually caused by an event that happened in 2019, uh, but the 2020 water year was picking up the tail end of everything receding. So. Um, Generally, it's good to use the water year, but it kind of just to note that it depends on where you're at and what you're studying. So for identically distributed, the peak flow time series is assumed to be represented, a representative sample of the parent population, future floods. In this case, you know, we assume that the population is usually distributed according to the log Pearson type 3 distribution. Uh, this can be violated in multiple different ways. So visual inspection of the time series plot can reveal obvious changes in the mean or variance. Uh, for example, construction of an upstream dam and reservoir, land use, water management, climate change, or mixed population. Uh, this image is a really good example of that. And this is really typical of what you see if you have a stream gauge before you construct a dam. You can see this is the wild west in terms of flows here, uh, kind of towards the earlier period of record. 
But in the latter period of record, you can see everything falls in line. So like if you see a signal like this in your data set, that's a really big cause for concern. Um, we also have a lot of tests and tools that the core has developed for looking at non-stationarity and mean and variance and distribution. And I'm going to talk all about that in our climate change and non-stationarity lecture. But it's always important to plot the data that you'd like to work with in your analysis and do some just basic trend analysis and visual inspection to look for these types of signals before you even begin. So why is it important to treat regulated data sets differently? Um, we usually are trying to extrapolate to really remote AEPs. Uh, you know, if, especially if you're doing a, a dam safety study as opposed to a levee safety study, you're out to E to the minus five, E to the minus six, somewhere out in that range. And we never have that much data. You know, we're usually lucky if we have about 100 years of systematic data, which if you think about the sample space that we have, which is maybe 100 years versus the population, which is close to infinity, that's just a blip. <laughs> And so we're trying to use that information to estimate really rare exceedance probabilities. Uh, and to do that, we use statistical inference. So we're trying to fit a probability distribution to that data. And if we have a poor data set or a poor representative sample of that overall population, you know, we can get really poor estimates of our flood risk at our dams. Um, if flow frequency analysis is conducted on regulated data sets, this effect can be really dramatic. You can over at or underestimate the flood risk of the upper tail of the loading curve. It's generally not recommended to fit log Pearson type three parameters or really any parametric statistical distribution to regulated data sets. Uh, and this example really shows why. So the blue data points and the blue curve are the unregulated data for a specific reservoir. And then the red data points and the red curve are the regulated flows from the reservoir. And you can see why this is the case is because like, obviously we have these flat spots here where they're trying to regulate to avoid something. So maybe they have a downstream flow constraint at about 9,000 CFS and they're trying to limit downstream discharges. Uh, or maybe up here, this is important for some kind of flood control regulation. But this isn't natural. So we're basically, we're violating all the random processes that happen in nature to change this. And that randomness, uh, that like stochastic ability is what we need to be able to fit a distribution to a data set. And you can see this has a really dramatic effect at the upper end because our estimate of, you know, what discharge is associated with the 10,000 year event is orders of magnitude different because we tried to fit a distribution to a regulated data set as opposed to an unregulated data set. So you always want to obtain unregulated data, or if you don't have it, uh, we have all kinds of methods for calculating unregulated data from your regulated data sets. Um, this is a really great reference that the RMC put out for dams and levees that have upstream regulation. That's called Estimated Flood Hazard for Dams and Levees with Upstream Regulation, and it's found on the publication section of the RMC website. Uh, it's got a lot, of great, a lot of great guidance for the development of unregulated inflow data sets to a dam or a levee, and the development of stage frequency curves uh, applicable to a system with upstream regulation. So it covers kind of from A to Z, how do you go about obtaining your data and coming up with an estimate of the hydrologic hazard? Okay, next, we're going to talk about potential, potentially influential low floods, or I think Bolton 17C and some other documents informally call them PILFs. Um, these usually describe very small observations that can have a disproportionate impact on the upper end of the frequency curve. So when we're doing these types of studies, uh, we're really focused on you know, events that happen infrequently. And that was one of the recommendations that came out of Bulletin 17C that was incorporated, or Bulletin 17B, sorry, that was incorporated into Bulletin 17C, was to come up with a method for really focusing how do we improve our estimates of flood risk. And so one of those improvements between 17B and 17C was the identification and screening for potentially influential low floods. And this is really important because the low floods and high floods, typically there are different physical processes at play. Um, which, you know, for the high floods, it's obviously very, obviously very important for flood risk, but for low floods, we're not seeing that same impact. So why these low values matter? Um, there's these two concepts of leverage and influence. 
And so observations that have high leverage, they have potential to alter model results. And so the image on the left here, uh, this shows a couple data points. And this point down here uh, in the lower left-hand corner has high leverage, although it's not influencing model results. Um, the image on the right shows observations with high influence that actually do impact model results. So you can say, essentially, we have the same uh, six data points here that we had in the left image, but we've just kicked this up. And you can see that in this case, our simple regression line is not fitting the data well anymore at the upper end. And so this is the same kind of an impact that you can see with potentially influential low floods. So this is an example uh, from Bulletin 17C and Appendix 10. It's actually example number six, showing the peak flow frequency curve with the low outliers removed. And this is the same gauge and the same data, but with the low outliers left in. And you can see the significant influence that these low data points have. Like, essentially, if we include all those low data points, we end up with a significantly more negative skewed distribution and a very different flow frequency curve. Um, and what's interesting to this is we'll talk about the multiple grubs back test in a minute that you can use to detect these low outliers. But I mean, you can just looking at this data. If you think in terms of the physical processes that are driving these floods versus these floods up here, I mean, you can see this giant gap here. And this should always be a telltale sign that your potentially influential low flood thresholds or what you should consider as a low flood, look for that yeah. right off the bat before you do any kind of analysis, um, plot these data points up and that can give you a really good idea of what your threshold will probably be. So Bulletin 17C has implemented the Multiple Grubs Beck Test, or MGBT, and RMC Best Fit, our uh, Bayesian estimation and fitting software for doing flow frequency analysis, also incorporates this test. Uh, it's a statistically appropriate generalization of the Grubs Beck Test that was included in Bulletin 17B, uh, but it's sensitive to the possibility that there might be several small observations that could potentially impact your flow frequency curve. The original Grubbs Beck test concluded in Bulletin 17B uh, generally at most would flag one, your lowest data point as a low outlier, and it would just include that when in fact there could be more. Uh, so that was the really big benefit of using the multiple Grubbs Beck test is it has the ability to look at more than a single point. So what this means for us is Test the influence on low outlier, it tests the influence the low outliers have on the log Pearson type 3 parameters. You can run different analyses in BestFit to understand how the log Pearson type 3 parameters are changing by doing sensitivity tests. And like Alan had said, we love doing sensitivity tests and hydrologic hazard work. Um, in some cases, several outliers can mask the others, meaning really only a few of them have influence. So it's usually a good practice to run your best fit analysis. It'll automatically run its default multiple grub, grub spec test threshold. And then you can work on increasing or decreasing that threshold and look at the impact it has on your overall flow frequency curve. Like how much influence and leverage does that threshold actually have on the upper end of the curve when you're getting out to, you know, e to the minus one, two, three, four, and five exceedance probabilities. Uh, next, we're going to talk about period of record extension. Uh, so generally, for most of our sites, if we're lucky, we have some kind of a gauge. A lot of like USACE projects and USGS sites will include flow and stage data for reservoirs, or if it's a levee, there's usually a gauge near the levee. Um, but sometimes we don't have that. <clears throat> so the first step is just to look around. Um, if you can, get the data at your site, and that's a great starting point. But then you need to start your detective work and see if you can find additional gauge data or come up with some additional systematic data that you can use for your analysis. Uh, always check for inactive gauges. So the USGS, historically, you know, they have their active gauging network. And you go to the NWIS mapper, NWIS mapper, just Google that. And that will show all the active USGS gauges. But there's also a filter for inactive USGS gauges. And this is awesome because like I was working on a study out in Connecticut uh, for a dam that was built in about the 1960s. And so I had inflow outflow and elevation records for that dam from 1960 to present. But there was an inactive gauge about a thousand feet downstream, no intervening tributaries, roughly the same drainage area. 
that had data going back to 1920. <laughs> and so I could just grab that inactive data and I can add it to my systematic data set because the, it was essentially capturing the same discharges as just when they built the dam, they decided to move the gauge to the dam. Um, it's also important because, you know, just because they have a stream gauge doesn't mean it's getting funded every year. You know, there are gauges on a project I'm working on in Wisconsin where it floods and then they pay to have the gauge start monitoring and then they get tired of paying for it. And then it floods again, so they start paying to have it monitoring. So it's capturing all the not really large flood events. And so it kind of comes and goes depending on what they can maintain because, you know, they're just like any other organization. They, they have a budget of, you know, what gauges they can and cannot maintain. Um, data transformation. So there are methods for transferring data from two gauges with overlapping periods of record. Uh, this image shows that here uh, between these green points and the red points. So the green points is the long record at a nearby site. And the red points is the short record at the site we're interested in. And you can develop a simple relationship between the concurrent observed observations that you can actually estimate what those short-term record sites should be for the latter half or the missing period on here. Uh, that's a really good starting point, but if the risk, if you're doing a risk assessment, or especially if you're doing a higher level of study, uh, it's really important to go through the process of maybe extending your record using a more complicated method. So methods like maintenance of variance extension type one or move one or move three. Uh, Bulletin 17C recommends using the move three equations and one of their appendices actually details um, every step of how to actually extend your period of record. You can do that in a spreadsheet calculation or there are various products out there uh, that do these calculations automatically for you if you supply the data sets. And anytime you're doing these types of data transformation, uh, you have to make sure that the stream gauge you're interested in and the stream gauge you're using to help extend your period of record should be hydrologically similar. They should be getting the same, experiencing the same storm events. They should be showing floods at the same time when they have concurrent period of record. And they should just be generally similar. So you can't take a gauge that's several hundred miles away on a different reservoir system and try to apply that because it's just not appropriate. They're not getting the same hydrologic impact and they're also not getting the same meteorology. And always remember that when you're doing this type of analysis, you want to work with unregulated data for your site of interest and then any other gauges that you're pulling into your analysis, those should also be unregulated. So if you have regulated data that you could pull into your analysis, you need to go through the process of trying to figure out what those unregulated or natural random flows are. Uh, if there's no overlapping record for comparison of events, you can use a drainage area ratio and that equation is shown on the screen here. Uh, so it's basically the the flow that you're trying to estimate for your site is represented by the Y variable. Uh, X is from a different nearby hydrologically similar site. And then you're just essentially multiplying by a ratio of the two different drainage areas. So in widespread practice, um, the exponent phi, which is used as a bias correction, is set equal to one. And that's because flow just doesn't increase linearly with drainage area. Um, you know, it's nonlinear. Just because you have twice as much drainage area doesn't mean you're going to have twice as much flow. In reality, you might have probably somewhere between, you know, twice as much and flow equal to whatever was observed at your gauge site. Uh, the USGS actually has a lot of great regional study information about these fee exponents. Uh, like I know in Minnesota and Wisconsin and North Dakota, they've got seasonal studies with fee exponents. And so sometimes you can actually look this information up. You can actually do look at previous studies in the area, or if you're really out of luck and you don't think that fee should be one, you can look at several gauges in your watershed that are unregulated, and you can estimate this fee exponent. Because if you just take the logarithm of both sides of this equation for two sites where you know what the flow is and you know what the drainage area is, you can kind of work out what fee should be, and you can do that for a couple of different sites. And that can be a really great way to come up with an improved estimate for these ungauged areas. So in summary, uh, you should have an understanding of what it takes to have consistent data set. And you want to ensure that your data is independent and identically distributed. That's really critical, especially for the rare exceedance probabilities that we're trying to extrapolate out to for dam safety analysis and levee safety analysis. Uh, standard flow frequency analysis or stage frequency analysis requires that the data be independent and identically distributed. Uh, you should understand the importance of using unregulated data. 
for the most part, we never want to take regulated data as is and run it through a full flow frequency analysis because that's it's not random. And in order to do statistical inference, we have to have a natural random set or sample set from our overall population. Uh, the RMC document TR2021-02, which we showed on a previous slide, provides a lot of great guidance on how to come up with unregulated consistent data sets and extend your period of record when developing your hydrologic hazard curve. And we also saw the importance of using weight of evidence approach to low outliers. Uh, there are certainly times that data should be considered as low outliers, but again, we want to use as much data as we can in the flow frequency analysis. So don't take a simple low outlier test at face value. Use its sensitivity, because even though those low outliers, whatever we thought set the threshold at, uh, Derek's going to talk a little bit about this, it basically uses that threshold to represent low outliers as left sensor data. So it's important to do those sensitivity tests and look at the impact your threshold has on the actual upper end of the frequency curve. Because if you can set that as low as possible without impacting your upper end of the frequency curve, you're including that much more systematic data in your estimate. And every data point counts. 